Hello, I'm Dr Sophie Duncan and I'm a research fellow at the University of Oxford. This is a series on sex and gender in Elizabethan England and in this first talk we'll be thinking about masculinity, femininity and ideas of sex and gender in early modern England. So this talk introduces early modern ideas of sex, gender, femininity and masculinity. Elizabethan England was a really hierarchical society and, generally speaking, women lacked power. But it's quite dangerous, actually, to talk in general about women or any group in early modern England because life situations and experiences really varied, as they do today, for people depending not only on their gender but also their age, their race and their class and their sexuality. And we'll be thinking about how some of those things intersect with sex and gender today. There were obvious dramatic ways in which women lacked power in early modern England. There was no concept of marital rape, for example, although actually there was no concept of marital rape in UK law until the late 20th century. Women's property wasn't really a concept. Um, things an unmarried woman owned belonged to her father, and then when she got married, they belonged to her husband. Today, issues of gender are really pertinent, but in the early modern period, gender actually meant something quite different. If you said the word gender to an Elizabethan, they would have thought you were referring to engendering, a verb, so the verb to engender means roughly to generate, or to grammar. Um, not in English, but in Latin, French or German, nouns have a gender, and so that was the context in which you'd encounter the word gender. Masculinity, femininity and androgyny were all recognisable concepts, but the idea that your gender was something different to your biological sex um, isn't one they would have recognised. That doesn't mean it's not important or an illuminating way into Elizabethan life and literature. But it's important to bear in mind that often um, concepts we would see as belonging to gender they bundled up with the idea of sex. There was an important medical tradition of thinking about these things, and this very much derived from classical Rome and Greece, which was the tradition in which doctors would have been educated. And they formed their medical understanding in Elizabethan England based on what's often called the Galenic and the Aristotelian traditions, you might have heard of the ideas of the humours, so the idea that the body is made up of different concentrations of different substances that determine whether you are choleric, so you're really angry, or melancholic, so you're melancholy, and the idea that, generally speaking, men's humours were dry and hot, and women's were cold and damp. There was also the idea that the by what we would call a kind of biologically female body or an assigned female at birth body was based on a kind of inversion of the male so that the female reproductive system um, so the uterus, the vagina, the ovaries, the fallopian tubes are a sort of incomplete, inverted, internal version of the male genitals of testicles and penis. But running alongside the big scientific medical tradition was, unsurprisingly, Christianity and the understanding of women as formed to be men's helpmeets. One of the authors I will probably keep coming back to in this series because he is kind of usefully and memorably bonkers was a man called Joseph Swetnam. And in 1615, he wrote a book called The Arraignment of Women. Um, and he looked at the Christian idea in Genesis that um, Eve, the first woman, was made out of Adam, the first man's rib. And he said that what we learned from this was that women were made of the rib of a man and that their froward nature showeth. For a rib is a crooked thing, good for nothing else, and women are crooked by nature. The small occasion will cause them to be angry. So he thought, ah yes, the fact that women were made out of Adam's rib shows that they are useless and crooked and a kind of small thing compared to the greatness and completeness of a man. Another really interesting book, and I think you can find this one online, so Robert Cleaver's A Goodly Form of Household Government. So he published this in 1598, towards the end of Elizabeth's reign. 
and he said that a woman should stand in reverend awe of her husband throughout their married life. You might also um, have heard the idea that women are the weaker vessel, the idea of women as, a, as a weaker vessels than men. And that is also a 16th century invention. Um, it first comes into English discourse in 1526, and then in 1611, it also appears in the King James Bible. So this is an idea that was very current in Shakespeare's England. Now, even though masculinity was kind of seen as the default and pinnacle of what human beings could be, it's much better in Elizabethan England to be a man than a woman, there were real concerns through this period that women were beginning to behave more like men. And now what does that mean? That can mean lots of things. Um, but there were concerns that women were dressing more like men and were becoming more outspoken and more ambitious to be like men, to be admitted into institutions to which they had no access. And they would continue having no access to universities and governments for kind of another three centuries. But there is this anxiety that women are beginning to behave more like men. And masculinity in Elizabethan England is a really interesting concept. Um, when we talk about identities today, um, we tend to think of our identities as intrinsic qualities. We might say, you know, I, I am or I identify as a woman. We might say, I am gay. But in the early modern period, identity is less a matter of what you are, apart from in kind of strict biological terms, it's what you do. So masculinity is something you perform. And it's about strength, it's about courage, but also in Elizabethan England, it's about civility. It's about being a gentleman, it's about behaving in a sort of courteous way. And a really interesting concept for thinking about masculinity that's also important to thinking about how economy and money works at the time, and generally men control money in Elizabethan England, is the idea of credit. So in Elizabethan England, Although there were obviously people who had huge fortunes, there wasn't a lot in the way of physical money. So there weren't that many coins in circulation, for example. And so a lot of early modern um, England's economy depended on credit, on the idea of debts bought and sold, and upon about how much you could borrow. And credit comes from the Latin word meaning believe. So it's your reputation, and masculinity is built on credit your standing in society, your honour, your outward face that you present to the world. And above all, masculinity is about being an adult man. And to be an adult, a grown-up man, means that you are ready to marry and head up your own household. And that's very important. The kind of converse of masculinity um, is the idea of effeminacy, which I wanted to say a bit about. So if you know anything about kind of the history of camp or the way gay men have been perceived in 20th and 21st century culture, you'll know that effeminacy, the idea of being a feminine man, is associated with same-sex desire. This is absolutely not true in the early modern period. Effeminate men, or kind of being supposedly effeminate, is still not a good thing in the early modern period as it continues to be kind of in homophobic 20th century and 21st century England, but it's associated with excessive love of women. That if you're too into women um, and too fond as a man of romance and passion, that will make you effeminate. It's what Romeo says about Juliet. He says, you know, thy love has made me effeminate. Now, before talking about femininity, it's worth saying a bit about androgyny. So the idea of the person who has feminine and masculine characteristics. And there were some people then as now in the early modern, um, in the early modern period who were intersex in some way. And unsurprisingly, in the very kind of rigid binary environment of the time, that was regarded with great suspicion and horror. And so if you come across that in the text, that's the reception that anybody who troubles a kind of strict binary would get. It's one of the reasons people are so troubled by the idea of cross-dressing in the period. Although, as I'll say in a later talk, it's also part of the kind of richness of theatrical tradition. But the really interesting thing about androgyny and sort of sexual doubleness in the period is that, of course, Elizabethan England is headed by a queen. Um, an incredibly powerful woman, 
who challenges some of ideas about what life was like for women or what a woman was in the early modern period. But Elizabeth played up to both her femininity, you know, she was very flirtatious, there was a kind of courtly love tradition around her, but at the same time stressed her, her political masculinity, um, the way she was similar to her father, King Henry VIII. And if people know one speech by Elizabeth, it will be when she says, um, she has, you know, the, the body, the feeble body of a woman, but she has the heart and stomach of a king and a king of England too. It's her speech at Tilbury. So that's one of the contradictions in early modern England, this horror of androgyny and the kind of indeterminate, but also a queen who powerfully deploys kind of feminine and masculine attributes to her own political advantage. I'll talk more about what it means to be a woman in the next lecture, but femininity in the period is very much constructed in opposition to, and almost in kind of deviation from the masculine, because there is this idea, inherited as I said from the classical tradition, that the man is kind of the complete status of um, a human being, and so that the woman is in some ways an incomplete or an inverted or a lesser man. But the one thing I wanted to end by talking about just now is sexuality. And how we talk about sexuality has varied hugely over kind of the critical history of the early modern period. One very influential view that you might see put forward in other criticism comes from a writer called Michel Foucault in his 20th century work, The History of Sexuality. And he talks about homosexuality and how it's been understood over the centuries. And he argues that before the 19th century, the idea of homosexuality as an identity or as the homosexual as a person whose sexuality is intrinsic to their identity, he argues that that didn't really exist. Um, that there was the idea of illegal sex acts, there was the idea of illegal sex acts, but there wasn't an identity until the 19th century when for various reasons, including the phenomenon of Oscar Wilde, the idea of the homosexual was invented. And I'm kind of rehearsing this a little bit here because one criticism that I often see is the idea that we shouldn't talk about um, anyone from the pre-19th century period as homosexual because it's anachronistic. And the idea that in the early modern period, like masculinity, sexuality wasn't something you were, sects act, which is a horrible way of putting it, was something you did. So you get lots of critics who say, you can't say that you can't say somebody was gay or lesbian or bisexual because they wouldn't have understood those terms. And a couple of things to say about that are, one, there is a critical school of thought called presentism that says we absolutely apply labels from today to the past because that reflects how we actually encounter texts embedded in and in conversation with other literary and cultural phenomena in the present. I'm devoting another lecture in this series to same-sex desire, but I just wanted to set th those ideas up now. The other thing to say is that although you don't, you're right, you don't get people using those terms, there were people who had passionate, important same-sex relationships in the period. So I would encourage you to kind of explore that terminology and those possibilities a little more in your own work.